Welcome everybody. Um, tonight is a little bit different. Chuck Morgan and I did do an interview, um, but we had, he's in Hawaii. So we had a lot of um, technical difficulties and, you know, just things like that. So we thought, uh, why not just do it live now? Luckily, you know, we're both still available. Um, he knows his stuff. Chuck is, he was in the Nuwabian organization. We'll use the word organization just to be respectful um, starting out. And, but he left the group and he started his own um, journey, I, I guess you would say. And he started a website, Nuwapianism. I will definitely put the link in the description box. Mm -hmm. So um, Chuck, yes. let's, we're gonna get right into it. But okay. uh, for those, I know you've been around and a lot of people know you already, but for those of us who may not be familiar with you, can you just give us a brief um, you know, what years you were in the organization, uh, what made you leave and that kind of thing. And then we're going to get right into this relationship between the Nuwabians, Malachi York and Africa Bambada and the Zulu nation. OK, um, my start began around 1989 in Washington, D.C. And um, I didn't actually meet York until about 1990, which was the next, that next year, uh, sometime during the winter. Um, I had been with the organization very active uh, with talk radio. Um, I was more into the doctrine. I used to uh, go by the by the name um, Kedar. That was initially my, my name. And then uh, that someone else, um, when I got transferred down to Florida, um, I took on the name Idris, which um, was one who studies. And that was um, my claim to fame within the organization as one who studied, one who dealt with doctrine, um, you know, bits and bad dips into the language. Um, that was what York had um, uh, saw favoring me from uh, my talk radio days in Washington, D.C. on uh, one of the Radio One um, stations. And um, we developed a friendship over the years from about 1990 on up until he was um, convicted. So um, I actually didn't necessarily leave the organization. I stayed with it all the way up until I actually left and came to Hawaii. Even when I came here, I was still, I could still classify myself as um, being a part of the New Orleans organization. And then it wasn't until around 2011 that I started to question it. And um, I would contact some of the uh, teachers that I knew and I would just ask them different questions from the publications because once you step away from it for a while, and then you go back and you look at it, you kind of have different views of it or some of the things that you may have acquired learning and then you uh, challenged it. So I, I, I more or less challenged it from a, a position of doubt as opposed to questioning it to regurgitate it. Well, I want to say um, for those of you who haven't listened to the podcast that, that we did for Trapped in a Culture, um, Chuck was very instrumental. <laughs> that was another reason why I didn't do his interview because I would be like, what? Wait a minute. What? You all would be <laughs> yeah. like, you think I'm getting criticized for the footage now? You really be yeah. criticizing me. So I thought it was better for him to come. But thank you, Chuck, for all yeah. of your additional research. Um, helping me to understand because I'm from Chicago and right. uh, in my upbringing, York didn't, was not a presence like that in my right. city, at least that I was not, at least that I, I was aware of. So mm -hmm. um, thank you. So yeah. let's get right to it. I have some things that I'll be sharing my screen okay. uh, while you're talking. So I have some mm -hmm. notes and let me just go to that. Now, um, before we get into the, I like dealing with chronology also. So can you, I'm gonna pull up York's arrest record from the 60s. Can you tell us who, he, I know he took on this persona where he was from another planet um, and he was channeling these beings and you know a lot of different incarnations, but can we just start with what you know about um, his his beginnings and, and how, and, just his beginnings, and then I'll ask you the next question. You mean his beginning in, in terms of uh, when he, his, his pursuit of forming an organization? Because- Yeah, yeah like his background. Mm -hmm. Okay, his background, and when you go back to, say around the, 19, the mid 1960s, 
All right, in 1964, he was uh, incarcerated and he went to prison over um, a gang fight. And um, prior to that, this is what you're looking at now would be from the, um, the pre-sentencing investigation report, which was to determine um, when he had pled guilty, what his um, sentence would be based on the pre-sentencing pre investigation report. And uh, that had his arrest record. It had his um, education. Uh, it, it, it ran everything from what he was charged with, um, the uh, severity of the crime, and all of those things uh, had determined what um, the judge was going to decide in terms of the, um, in the, uh, the based on the report, what, how much time he would, uh, be, would be getting. And um, what we know by way of the in investigation, and it was also corroborated by his sister, Dale Brown, or uh, no, we know as Waki. Um, when you, back in the 1960s, um, there's a little bit of a controversy because the talking point within the organization is that he was teaching throughout the 60s. But we know from his own bio that he wrote in a book called the Rebuttal to the Slanderers, Ansar Cult, Rebuttal to the Slanderers, which was uh, put together as a rebuttal to a book that was written by a Muslim named Bilal Phillips, who pretty much exposed the organization and gave insight that had not previously been, been um, known or documented to the, in the public square. So what we do know is that Shortly after his time in prison, when he was paroled in around 68, he started to more or less use a hustle, which was the religion of Islam, because it was something that was rising. Of course, the nation of Islam was prominent at that time um, because he had he was a, considered a career criminal or a, a petty thief as, as, as a petty criminal in New York. One of the um, avenues that he chose was Islam. And we know this based on his own words late years later, after Bilal Phillips' book came out, he then broke away from Islam and then even wrote books attacking Islam and even put an audio where he taught us. And then it was also released to the public who says, why we used Islam. He said, I needed to develop a cult. His words, I needed to develop, I'm just paraphrasing, but he does use the word cult. I need to develop a cult which would keep the Christians away. It would keep the Hebrew Israelites away. It would keep the Muslims away. And I needed a symbol. And the symbol that he chose, he said, it would be a six-pointed star, crescent, and an unk. And call it the Nubian Islamic Hebrews. Okay, and, hold and on. That's where it started. Before, before we go too far down that road, I wanted you to tell us about some of the charges that he was charged with in the 60s. Okay. Um, and I, I'm, I was trying to, I was fooling around. If you can pull it up. up. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm getting to it. As a matter of fact, let me see. I just have so many screens up. Can you see? Okay, here we go. So we have on January 7, 1964, unlaw unlawful entry in Kings County, um, 1964 in June, rape in the third degree. Mm-hmm. That was with um, that would involve a 16 year old when he was uh, 18 and he had it was a um, it was considered a statutory rape. As a matter of fact, it was um, uh, it was the uh, date of charge. It was um, July 1st, 1964. He was 18. It was um, well, that was it was one charge. It was unlawful entry. And then the um, 1964, it was June 25th, the day before his birthday where it was rape in the third degree, and he was convicted on July 10th, and sentence was suspended, and he was placed on probation. Do we and know so, the circumstances of that case? Sorry to interrupt you. Do we know the age of the victim in that case? The um, person um, was, uh, according to the pre-sentencing investigation report, she was um, 16. As a matter of fact, um, the defendant's criminal history, juvenile adjudications, uh, we have here, so it says here in the pre-sentence investigation that on, um, the defendant reported that he was represented by counsel. The circumstances of the offense could not be obtained. However, it is noted that the defendant related 
and his sister Dale Brown confirmed that the defendant was arrested and charged for having sexual contact with his minor girlfriend, who was reported to be approximately 16 years of age. Oh, and York would have been approximately what age? In he was 18 at the time. Okay, she was 16 and he was 18. Yeah. Okay, and he and it says that he got um, uh, 30 days in jail. Yeah. Is that one for the uh, statutory rate? For the July 7th. Yeah. Arrest. Um, yeah. Now, on, on the podcast in our previous interview, you you made the statement um, that it was in jail where where he came up with his hustle of Islam. Yeah, because it was around that time that um, prior to this, because he what you had the tendency to do was to try to lay out a phony narrative about his his whereabouts or upbringing, because the, the talking point within the organization is that he had resided with um, Sheikh Daoud Akhma Faisal of the State Street community or mosque that was in Brooklyn as well. Now, we don't have any confirmation of that. Sheikh Daoud has never gone on record stating that, but this is one of the talking points that York used because we do know from the investigation report that because the family was dealing with um, you know, financial issues, the, the, he and his siblings were dispersed periodically to different relatives. All right. And so um, according to York, he stayed with uh, Sheikh Daoud from age 12 on up. But again, there's no confirmation of this whatsoever. But we do know that prior, we don't find any evidence whatsoever of any Islamic dealings, but we do find it subsequent to his uh, parole. Yeah. Well, and, um, um, mm -hmm. go ahead, right? And, go ahead. And, and it wasn't until around 1970 that the official organization began, but there was, he was, you know, he and some of the other individuals that he was able to round up would go around Coney Island and different parts of New York passing out leaflets. And that was what spearheaded his uh, his road or his journey into where we eventually see he uh, ended up in terms of being the um, Islamic leader and then a, a plethora of other um, denominational characters that he personified. OK, let's stop right there. So York was um, incarcerated numerous times in the 60s. And are you saying, I just want us to be clear, and about what year do you think this is? After he was released from jail, I don't think he went to prison. It looks like he was just- Well, he was in jail, right. yeah. Yeah, yeah right Island. Yeah, right so Island. after he was released from jail, mm -hmm. he takes on a, a persona at this point, or is he just trying to spread the truth and he has followers? Or what year would you and what year would you say this is? Well, it gets murky, but according to York's own words coming from the rebuttal book, he talks about in the 1960s, from 1967 and 68, he began teaching the early stages of Islam that he was involved in. Now, anything that came after that about he teaching uh, some sophisticated mystical doctrine prior to Islam is all coming from 1990. Prior to that, everything was centered around Islam. Okay. Okay. So we're saying that um, a marked change would be 1990. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, um, do you know, do you happen to know, and if you don't, it's fine, and yeah. we'll, we'll move on. Do you happen to know, um, because I know the Nuwabians are not unlike a lot of other um, cults, right? Mm -hmm. And what happens is that the cult leader has to keep updating the doctrine. Right. Like they'll have these prophecies that's supposed to end on such and such date and this is supposed to happen and yeah. you know all these different things. But then when it doesn't happen, they kind of update their Absolutely. Um, he, doctrine. He definitely did that. <laughs> now, do you know um, how many incarnations? Because I know the Nuwabians went through several name changes and uh, like personas um, between 1970 and 1990. I don't want to go past 1990 just yet. But between 1970 and 1990, do we know how many incarnations they went through? Well, that was the thing. It didn't start to change until after Bilal Phillips's book that came out in 1989. Can you explain what that book is? Okay, uh, real fast, real fast. <clears throat> the book was called The Ansar Cult in America by Bilal Phillips. And what it was uh, designed to do was expose the Ansars in America as being a... Um, 
a, a fallacious Islamic organization or a front like organization that the leader used as a hustle. Was Bilal That's essentially white? Essentially, what it is, huh? Was he white? Uh, what What was Bilal's name? Uh, oh, Bilal Phillips. He was a um, a black per a black man, um, a West Indian, as, as York would call him. So, um, yeah, and um, he put that publication out, and he had several other people who were ex members of the organization, men and women, who gave their their history of the organization with their time spent within the organization around York and some of the things that they saw. And he exposed things like the welfare fraud, um, uh, various things. You, you're the, saying welfare fraud and all of that from 1970s to 1990, that was already occurring? Well, around the around about the 80s, I'm not sure exactly when he started you know, taking people's money in terms of um, you had to turn in the uh, welfare checks all that stuff because by the time I, we came in around 89 they were still doing it so there was no no history as to when it started but from what i do know is that when you came in the la the ladies had to get on welfare um the food stamps the the idea was that when you have food stamps we buy in bulk so everyone is taken care of so you turn over the welfare checks, you turn over the money, the money goes to whatever. It goes to the office. And that takes care of this, that, whatever the need, expenses are needed within the organization. That's where that money goes for. That's your obligation as a sister. And of course, the sisters had uh, jobs and chores and things that they did. But primarily, that was one of them. The um, welfare. So, so let me ask you this. In, the, in those days, um, was it separate living from the rest of society at that point in Brooklyn or, or it was just everybody lived at home, but they came to the temple or whatever that was called? Well, it was two parts. You had, a, this is what you had. You had the supporters, which were people who lived on the outside. Then you had those who wanted to be a part of the organization from within. Because what the requirement was is that you moved into the, tem the temple community or the uh, tabernacle and you had to uh, fill out a, a form, you had to take a physical, and you had to answer a series of questions on sex life, this, that, venereal diseases, all of that stuff. Everything is in entwined into that. So you had, once you got permission or you were cleared to move in, that's when you moved in and you became a part of the organization. If you're a brother, you had to go out every day and peddle or propagate. The implication was that by propagation, you're trying to reach souls or bring people with into the fold of, or bring them to the class where he can teach them. But the, what, it, what it became more a system of was that you had to raise as much money as possible because there were other people. And then if your money was the lowest money, then you had to do guard duty. And at times, those who turned in the most money got a chance to go to the green room. And the green room became infamous because in Bilal Phillips's book, some of the members mentioned the green room in New York. And this was something that was also a part of the support or satellite communities around the East, up and down the East Coast. And the green room was a place that for one night, you and your spouse, girlfriend, mate, whatever, are allowed to go to this location and have sex. Then you come back in the next day. Let me ask you this, and then we're going to move on. But it's just so it's just I get long with you. Know, it, so no, no, no. You're you're totally fine. You're you're doing. You know, your answers are perfect. It's just so funny. I have I have two things. One is a comment. It's so funny how we all accept the fact that um, Jim Jones was like some kind of CIA mind control experiment, and there have been many journalists, even. Um, May Brussel and a lot of people who um, did a lot of reporting mm -hmm. on Jim Jones, but I wouldn't be surprised if some of our modern day black uh, cult leaders are also the same way, especially what we're going to get into, which is York's influence on hip hop and, and everything. So before we get to that, I have one last question on this era, and that is when your money was low, as you just described, would there be, what do you mean you had to do guard duty? And was there some kind of physical punishment associated yeah, with that? Yeah. 
um, depending on which community you lived in would determine that. Now, from what I know from the time I passed through New York, um, if a person was um, consistently low and the assumption is that they had the means to make the money, they were shaken down or they were physically beaten to get the money. And I remember a few incidences where uh, in the mid 90s in Baltimore, where I was at one time, when um, an individual from New York, Matin, RIP, uh, he wanted to, because he took over for another individual and he wanted to have it set up like it was in New York because that was where he was from. And there was, I'm real fast, there was an individual that um, in Baltimore, they used to give you medicine or drugs, just as, as experimental drugs. And it had an adverse effect on one individual. And this individual was receiving uh, medication and compensation financially. So when he would turn in his money, there was a time that he wouldn't turn all of his money in. And then the money that he didn't turn in, he did go to the corner store and bought some food to eat. Uh, the person in charge saw that. That was a violation. They woke us up in the middle of the night and had a family meeting. And they put this brother on trial. And York's picture was on the wall. And Matt Tim is talking to him and referring to him, Baba, what do we do with this, 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 this man that's stealing from the babies? So... At that time, York's son was there because we had brought him from upstate down to um, Baltimore. And um, the verdict was that they kick him out as opposed to beating him up because we voted, no, they, just kick him out. Don't beat him up. You know, <laughs> what are you doing? And um, they eventually um, uh, put him out, but they took his money. And um, he had about $200 on him. And, um, you know, I guess he didn't want to turn it in. He just didn't. And he wasn't obligated, but according to the uh, rules, though the unwritten um, rules, you had to turn in that money. So what happened that um, how severe the punishment would be for not turning in the proper amount of money or your quota, the quota was $100 a day. And now uh, in New York, it might have been more, but I know in D.C., it was um, 100 Baltimore, we had about $50. Yeah. And um, we, if you didn't turn the money in, you just did guard. And that was at either post one, two, three, depending on the, the layout of the building, that's your post. And you protected with your life because at that time, the Sunnis were threatening to come and get Imam Asa, Dr. Yoho, you see? And so you had to, um, that was your, believe it or not, it, it, for some people it's supposed to be like, um, it, is a, it is a privilege to stand guard and fight for Dr. Yoho. But it was considered a punishment, excuse me, it was considered a punishment if you didn't turn in enough money. Okay, I swear this is the last one before we move on. <laughs> um, it's just so like, you know, I, I just want to make sure everybody knows what I know. And then, um, and so they, they'll understand my approach and attitude right. with this whole thing. Um, <clears throat> now, as I said, I'm from Chicago. Right. And um, so you're talking about the Washington, D.C. and Baltimore area. Now, would you say, where would you say York's main, in, we know about New York. Did he have, and, and I'm specifically talking about 1970 to 1990. I know that when he started um, engaging the artists in hip hop, which we're about to get to, that of course it exploded elsewhere. But during that time, do we know that if he was a member of the Nation of Islam and um, what was his influence? Was it just the Eastern Seaboard or did it expand elsewhere? It was primarily along the East Coast in um, major cities, just along that, um, that Eastern section of New York, Philadelphia, Boston, uh, North Carolina, um, eventually Florida, and then it slowly um, spread inland more and more. Um, what was the, what was the other part of the question? I know that. Um, um, what, was he a member of the Nation of Islam, like no. under um, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, or because I've heard him speak on Louis Farrakhan, so right. that's why I'm asking. Right. No, that was always um, a, a controversy, but he did make that clear, and there's no evidence to support that he was either a member of the Black Panthers or the Nation of Islam. What he did want to do, as a matter of fact, in the rebuttal book. He talks about he didn't even know about the teachings of um, the Morris Science Temple, and he came across the, the teaching of uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad while he was incarcerated. Oh, guys who were who were members who were incarcerated brought it to his attention. This is what he says in the rebuttal 
to the slanderous book. Um, as far as being a member, no, his thing was that he, York, was the rightful successor to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad because he was the only one who had the ability to raise a nation, his words. Okay, now we're gonna jump right into um, York's relationship to the hip hop community. community. Mm -hmm. Two interviews ago, we released Daddy O's interview and Daddy O at the end of his interview talks about a new music seminar that took place at the Marriott Marquis in New York, where he arranged this meeting where he introduced Africa Bambata to um, Malachi York. Now, mm -hmm. before this, this instant, daddy -O says, and so does several other people, and, and we estimate this had to be in like the late 80s when this new music seminar happened where they had this meeting with um, Dr. York. So before then, Bambata's whole um, like persona was, Zulu nation, um, you know, peace, love, unity, having fun or whatever, but something, you know, um, maybe something happened at this meeting or some kind of instant, you know, uh, attraction to his teachings or his demeanor. I don't know. But um, while you explain to us what, what was going on with York, um, he was, I know, actively seeking to influence hip hop artists. And while you're explaining that, I'm gonna find this clip um, so that the audience can um, hear what we're yeah. talking about. During that, time, during that time, there was um, um, a, a branch within the uh, Nubian Islamic Hebrews, which was a, the Nubian nation. Um, York really started to promote that. And all of this stuff kept, kept, kept to come around shortly thereafter Bilal Phillips's book. So he started aligning himself with uh, people in, um, um, I guess you say hip hop. Now remember, York also pursued a music career and he did have some influence to an extent because in one video, um, I believe it's called It's On Me, he had members from um, Blue Magic there in, in a scene where they were at a, um, a cemetery. Um, York did put out a few videos. He produced a few people. Um, there's a video with he and Infume. Um, there's, um, of course, if, I don't know if you've seen it, the, the photos where he and uh, Russell Simmons, um, the late James Ingram was a, a, a strong supporter of York. He was he was hardcore New Wapian. I mean, even when I'm um, at the uh, Million Man March, the second one, he was there and he he made sure that we would get closest to the stage because he said, you know, we're his family, you know. Um, and of course, in the IRE uh, and a whole slew of other artists. So that was um, that was a vehicle which assisted him in putting his foot within that door because um, he said on, at a lecture on one of the True Light tapes, he said that uh, he saw that Marvin Gaye was able to reach more people for one album than all the imams did their khutbah on Friday. You know, so he said, I align myself with African Bambada. I align myself with third base. I align myself with Dougie Fretz. These people that I, meaning York, that I listened to and I listened to what they were saying, they were speaking messages. I'm going to play that. I'm going to play oh. that. And, <laughs> okay. then, and then we're going to come right back because when, I, when I'm gonna play this audio and when we come back, I wanna ask you about York Studios. Okay. I was with Bam Bob. Wait, not that one. Um, give me just a moment. Yeah. So, um, here we go. That was an interesting period because we were all wearing the jackets. That LL Cool J, Big Daddy Kane, Dougie Fresh, Third Base, uh, Kwame, uh, Shafi, and on and on and on, that these brothers who are rapping, that public enemy in them, are rapping messages out to the people. I went out and assimilated myself in the hip hop world and got to know Africa Bambada. 
and got to know Daddy Jeff, and got to know Dougie Fresh, and got to know all of these rappers, and sat down with them by building a recording studio that he, that he talked about. So he doesn't understand the power of building a recording studio. All the rap groups come to record with me. And when they come to record with me, I sit down and find out what they need. Now what happens is, the club set and follow our community, you go out there looking like album jackets by the rap group, you see our flag on the back of it. You see Fancy Mom Ace on the back of it. You see me now involving myself with the Zulu Nation on the African Mbada, they took their Shahada and became Muslim. Now, I um, talked to several artists in um, hip hop and York did build a recording studio and several people, including um, Africa Bambata, spent a lot of time over there at York Studios. And Bambata recorded um, the, the um, Planet, Rock Planet Rock remix at York Studios. Mm -hmm. But then I also spoke to someone who went for a meeting at York's office. And he, when he came from the back room, he had like an erection with these tight pants on. So it was a whole <laughs> just like, <laughs> Did you spend time at York Studios at all? No, no, I have not. All right. Sorry. Okay, so that in that recording, we hear that this hip hop organization organization's leader, Africa Bambada, he started the Universal Zulu Nation as a hip hop awareness group. Mm -hmm. Now, and which which doesn't mean he can't pursue his own religious beliefs or or what have you, but now we have him doing his Shahada with Malachi York. Yeah. And Shahada, can you please explain to us what, what your Shahada is? Yeah, a Shahada in Islam is uh, your um, affirmation that you are becoming a Muslim. Uh, you you sit down, I feel like I'm telling the mafia initiation ritual. <laughs> um, in the mosque, at least in DC, what we did. All right, so you sit in the chair and there are other Muslims around and then you put your finger and then you um, repeat after the uh, emir or imam who is um, reading to, reading what you're um, taking an oath to. So you're, 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 you're receiving, you're doing your shahada there. And then from that point on, you're now taking on the uh, role of a Muslim. Yeah. So that's right. Oh. I forget how the words go. It's been so long. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. That's that's good. Um, so let's fast forward. Um, so York is living this life. He is has this organization. Um, we're not going to go real all the way into his um, organization and, and right. members and all that stuff. Let's jump right to when he was finally arrested in the 2000s and mm -hmm. uh, what year that was. And I, 2002. I Okay, so 2002, he was arrested. Mm -hmm. I would like you to tell us what he was charged with, not convicted or pled out to. I would like to hear if you could tell our um, our people who are listening what he was charged with. And well, I'm initially, uh, I think it's kind of foggy, but it was um, transporting minors across state lines for the purpose of illegal sexual sexual activity and um, uh, money structuring along those lines. And then um, all these superseding charges came after the fact um, when um, this is so much went on between that period yeah. because initially he pled innocent and it wasn't until um, January of 2003 that he pled guilty in both federal and the state courts. I think one of them is on YouTube that people um, see can um, watch him when he's on. Uh, um, being told his rights and he uh, pleads guilty there. Um, and then uh, because of the sentencing issue, uh, 15 years was considered unreasonable because of the heinous amount and, and the, uh, the level of crime. Um, it, it was rejected. So York immediately the case went to court. <clears throat> I mean, I went to trial, I'm sorry. And that was in the federal so um, because he never took back his guilty plea in the state, that still sits today, a uh, dead docket. It could be uh, active at, at any time if he say he were uh, released. But um, it went to trial in 2004, January of 2004. 
And um, that's when uh, all everything came out. And uh, those who were victims, listed victims that testified, et cetera, um, that was uh, the whole, it was a short trial, actually. And then um, subsequent to that, of course, he was convicted. Well, okay. Now, York ended up pleading out, right? Well, he pled guilty to the state and the federal. And there was this, see, there's a background as to why that happened. And the reason why that it didn't come up in the trial because uh, the attorneys kind of did some negotiations. It's on the website, um, thewipingism.com, where you have this dialogue between uh, Adrian Patrick, uh, York's main um, attorney, and the prosecutor, um, Richard Maltry, and, uh, and they're talking about this. But what had happened was um, in, in 2002, late 2002, I think it was, York had uh, his blood his blood work examined mm -hmm. and likewise were some of the uh, listed victims. And once they were, um, once that blood uh, work came back and it, it was uh, shared with York's uh, attorneys, um, those who were directly involved in the case said that his best option would be to plead guilty because he had the uh, herpes simplex two virus that, couple of the other listed victims had as well and that is what led to the guilty plea in both the state and the federal because it'd be the thing was that it'd be kind of difficult to try to fight a case where you have um, a venereal disease and the same children had that venereal disease that are in your care because we live separately or segregated the children's house the little boy's house the little girl's house um, on rare occasions did men and women co-opt the same location because the brothers like on, on um, Tamil Ray at the time they stayed in this place called the barn which was, and, um, and, and excuse me for interrupting you Chuck where where are we where are you talking about this living where is this okay this was on the land this, this right? was the community living period no I mean this is where they moved to in Georgia, right? Okay. You're not talking about in Brooklyn, Bushwick. You're saying prior to move, prior to relocating to upstate New York, and and prior to moving to Georgia, segregated living was the standard and the norm in the community. And that's essentially it. York opened up his own cult compound, right? Upstate New York and in Georgia, or just in Georgia? Okay, real fast. Um, there was a lot of going on in New York. So York had brought property in the Catskill Mountains, Monticello, New York. And on that property, he had pulled away from Islam and that place would be known as Jazir Abba. Some kind of um, Sudanese word. It was a place of some place to paradise, what have you. And it was at that point that we started to, he began a new persona which was our attire we came out of the islamic garb and then started wearing cowboy gear we were walking around like cowboys with the cowboy hats that boots the whole thing also in addition to that we were taking on we dropped the islamic part in the title nubian islamic hebrews and became the nubian hebrews and then of course york with his, um, you know, playing with, with reality, saying that, oh, initially, before we taught Islam, we were Hebrews. We would always congregate and have our Shabbat at the, um, the uh, Hebrew Israelites communities. So then we started wearing different outfits. It wasn't the Jalabiyas, it was the Kamis. And it was patterned based on the book of Revelation, where you see um, the man, what is it? I'm in, in, I'm sorry, Revelation 114, when it talks about. I turned to the one, he was wearing, um, he had hair like lamb's wool, feet like fine brass, and he talks about he having a gold sash and all these things. So we would wear the yarmulke. We would um, wear um, the fringes, you know, the tassels on the side around the corners of the borders with the blue. The, uh, you try to, try to be as closest to what the Bible was saying, which kind of went ab above the other Hebrew groups at the time. All right. So those who moved upstate 
It was a very select group. And by that time, it was already known, according to the testimony from those who were involved, that the sexual activity had taken place already in Brooklyn. And by the time he went upstate, there were, he, was, he was pretty much under, he had no, no limits because he brought underage children upstate and the parents allowed it because unfortunately, a lot of them were duped into believing that, that propaganda that the 144,000 that are mentioned in the book of Revelation can only come by way of the angel Michael raising these children. And they had to be raised in an isolated environment that, according to the book of Revelation, which is what he used, they could not be uh, tempted and they can't be influenced by the harlot. The harlot, of course, being New York City, being America, the Babylon. All right. So they had to break away from that and move into a pristine palace like environment, peaceful. And that would be Jazza Abba. And when you went up there, it was highly in the skies and the clouds. And every time we would go up there, it would always rain. That was something he always complained about. And so it was based on the testimony from the trial, all of the gory details, many things took place up in upstate New York. Now, after that. Okay, sorry, hon. I just wanted to reiterate what you just said. So you're saying that he took the teachings from the book of Revelations and said that he was raising the 144,000 children of light. And he interpreted that to be actual minors and small children. And based on this teaching, the parents turned their children over to York to live isolated or um, segregated away from their parents well they were already segregated prior now you would have a, an infant of course up until a certain point then they'll be put inside the a unit which would be the younger babies or the kids or, the, or toddlers on on and on some there would be a monitor someone who would of course you know watch over them so being um isolated from your family like that wasn't anything new because that was considered part of the sudanese culture because remember york had by that time had his name changed to Asa El Hadi Al Mahdi from Dwight York to Asa El Hadi Al Mahdi. And I just did a show on that. You can find the um, article on the um, website where it shows you the, the, um, the documents from the courts where he had his name changed and who the attorneys was, his president, and his name Dwight York. Yeah. So um, by that time, of course, being segregated was nothing new. That was part of the culture. So they trusted him with their children because he was the lamb. He, that was part of the whole doctrine when he was teaching before he even went upstate was that he was the embodiment of Melchizedek. The angel Michael is Melchizedek, according to York. He was everybody, but the Michael was the one who had, he was the one that taught John the revelator in the book of Revelation about the 144,000. So as an avatar, I can't remember the word he used, but the avatar personified within him from past time, his body was utilized as being the one who was going to facilitate this raising of the 144,000. It was already known the 144,000 before he went upstate, but that was part of the new gimmick. And once he get upstate, he had a clear reason as to why you have all these kids around you because I'm the lamb. Now, um, these cult leaders and pedophiles are so crafty that, um, and it seems like when they're in power, they, their sexual gratification has no limits. Like first, first is conquering all the women. Mm -hmm. They even start having sex with the males. And then eventually they get to um, the children. So York's teaching, it seems to me, he crafted it to get access to these children and he moved them out of New York City and somewhere where it would probably be a lot more scrutiny and move them upstate. So mm -hmm. now, um, now he, moved, he, he leaves upstate 
already carrying on these acts with these um, babies because these babies were, you said, as young as um, four, five, six, and seven. Well, there was some that were that young. Now, there was an inner circle, one of them being, we can talk about because she's Habiba Washington, and a number of other girls who were known as Benats. These were the girls who were, um, they always wore the, they were called them brownies. They would wear the, the brown outfits and the veil and stuff. And um, the Benats, they were these little, um, this was his, his little inner circle. You know, it was similar to, if you ever watched the movie Enter the Dragon, and Mr. Han, used, whenever you saw him, you saw all these girls or women, young, these are my daughters. Yeah, you know, York did that same thing. He said those same things. You know, I don't know if he got it from the movie or whatever. But um, the people that he brought upstate were already being molested in Brooklyn. This was already known to certain people, you know, because he couldn't do it by himself. So that was one of the things that um, a lot of the victims or survivors that I've talked to is that, you know, a lot of people who um, who looked the other way, they um, enabled him to be able to do what he did. And there was a point that I was trying to make, I, I, I can't remember right now, but- um, I, I want you to, if you could tell us why, if you know why, why did he leave upstate New York and move to Georgia? Oh, it's, being in it's, it's funny. That's that. Now that is that will be difficult to really pinpoint because you know being up upstate, it was kind of isolated indeed, and it was very very cold up there. Now, from what I understand from him, is that he wanted to go down south. Now, of course, he always had a talking point or some type of excuse as to why he did what he did. So um, around 92, 93, he set up this young teachers program called the Young Disciples of the Lamb. And these were young teachers that he was to groom. And then when we go down to Georgia, they were going to um, be the elite teachers. Now, the whole 144,000 thing kind of started kind of drifting off. Then it's saying, we're the 144,000. You know, the, the idea of it started to fade away. You know, you find that in, in his publications that it, it slowly begins to deviate. Um, so with the young disciples, um, they were going to start to relocate because he wanted to go down there. Remember, we were dressed as cowboys, but also we were Native Americans upstate and he would have powwows upstate. So when he went down to Georgia, oh, yeah, it wasn't unusual because then he changed the name to. Well, he began to claim that he was of the Shoshone Native American bloodline and akin to Ben York of Lewis and Clark expedition yeah. okay so we're, we're gonna we're gonna move to a few more things and okay. if we have enough time we're gonna open it up um if anyone would like to come in with us and ask any questions okay what are we seeing here this is the land um what they call the land in uh tamaray and can you tell us what ended up happening with the feds and and everything in in georgia with the what Feds, the raid. Oh, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's the that's the property. That's Yorks's property. That's uh, Tamil Ray, Egypt of the West. When we first went down, it wasn't referred to as Egypt of the West. It was known as the Golden City, Wahani. That's what the name of it was. Um, of course, you see that Black Pyramid there. That was where you had a ritual that was called al Mugaraj, which is supposed to be um, um, an Osiris type of um, ritual. Uh, you go around it, and it, it's it's really funny because, you know, while all of this is going on, I haven't put the article out yet, but I'm gonna bring it. I'm gonna bring it out because uh, it, this ties into it in a, in a way. Um, <clears throat> the um, whole idea, once we got fully established within Georgia, we started taking on the name the Nuwabian Nation of Moors, as the Moors, um, we were the original mound builders. You know, and then York started aligning himself with um, a prominent elderly or older woman, uh, Veridachi Gostin L. Bay. And uh, her thing was she started pushing 
the writings of an individual who used to be, if there's ever such a thing, who used to be a neo-Nazi, Joseph, Joseph, oh my God, I can't remember his last name now. Joseph, it'll come back to me. But he was kicked out of the, um, uh, he was kicked out of the, um, the Aryan brother, he was kicked out of the neo-Nazi party because he got caught sexually abusing boys and he got convicted and he was sent to prison uh, for um or he went to prison for um molesting children boys and um after he came out over time he developed the uh, attack or an, uh, a, a tactic of selling books and he started writing books about ancient america and the original indigenous peoples of america being the original moors and then veradachi started quoting from his writings and she even brought him to lecture in front of her congregation and we know this because our representatives were there we had a sister who went by the name uh Sacagawea, who was really um you know a young sister out of philadelphia and she would sit there and take notes and that teaching that was coming from there, York started to alter the doctrine and started pushing the whole thing is that we are the original mound builders. We are the Moors. We're the Yamasi Native Americans. We're no longer the Shoshone. I just can't take it. I <laughs> know, it's, it's, it's a mess. <laughs> I just can't take it. I just can't take it. What? <laughs> I can't take the incarnations. Well, I mean, we haven't even oh, gotten. God. Let's let's switch to an audio while I can. After we hear this audio, please tell us what we're. I think I know where you're going. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. And you see. You hear the music in the background? Yeah. Yeah. That's um, of course, you know, in this valley music, you know, Hindu, what have you. And he always he, he always denigrated people of India as being the original black devils. And we were to avoid anything to do with that doctrine or anything that they teach. And it turns out he was in turn teaching it <laughs> or using it. Now that audio that we just heard was that played over the loudspeaker at uh, Tamare at the land down there. It would be played at times. Um, it was usually uh, audio that would be playing all the time because um, depending on a person, because when, when you, when I moved in, brothers would always have earphones on and they would be listening to true light tapes where they are listening to your, you know, lecture on the different points in the Bible, the Quran, et cetera, et cetera. And then there were others who were in the, the different mystical orders, the uh, ancient and mystic order of Melchizedek, um, uh, the ancient Egyptian order, et cetera, et cetera. They would listen to this type of stuff and then they would um, go through these little, you know, attempted rituals to, I guess, bring in their auras and make it more shiny or something, I don't know. But that was part of that spiritual stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, Tom Array is where York was. The compound was eventually raided. Yeah. He ended up being charged and he ended up being sentenced. Do we know mm -hmm. what his sentence is? Because I would like to get to Bambada after York was right. arrested. Okay. Um, as far as the sentencing is concerned, um, all right, so. Wasn't it he 135 was, years or something? Oh, he got 135 years. That was, um, okay, it was based on this. Okay. Uh, the, no, the nature of the offenses. All right. So he had got convicted on, he, he, it was 13 and he was convicted eight, nine, 
11 of 13. It was 11 of 13. So the most time that he got was on transporting minors across state lines for the purpose of illegal sex. All right. So um, where we have here, let me, because I have it right here. Okay. So uh, conspiracy to commit racketeering violations, 240 months. Racketeering acts, 240 months. Conspiracy to transport minors in interstate commerce for unlawful sexual activity. Conspiracy to travel in interstate commerce for unlawful sexual activity with minors. And conspiracy to structure cash transactions to evade currency transactions reporting requirements, 60 months. And then on and on and on. So uh, all totaling 1,620 months, 135 years. Um, in, the, in our interview, you were able to tell us um, some of the more disturbing aspects of the t uh, testimony that came out in court. Do you remember uh, it? Yeah, there that? were. And if, and if you don't, it's okay. Oh, uh, there was, uh, there was, I'm not, of course I wouldn't, wouldn't mention any names at, well. No, 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 no. Yeah. No. But yes, um, um, some of the more gory details was um, the anal scarring of um, a couple of individuals. In fact, they had a, um, a, a person who specializes in rape and child sexual abuse. And her, she had over, she, I think she had examined over 500 uh, children that had these signs of sexual trauma, physical trauma, and having pulverized anuses and on and on and on. So one, I think it was two individuals testified on their assessments based on their interactions with the victims, as well as what the victims said themselves. And they, they it's, it's, in the, it's on the website where they put them on a the table and they do all the whatever they do. And they were able to make this determination that it was definitely um, anal scarring that took place with this particular individual. And then of course, they asked what happened, how, and then it gave this litany of, of gory details about who did it, okay? So all of this stuff came out at trial. And um, based on that and other evidences to help support it, in addition to um, a, DNA and now, a DNA specialist who was able to determine that an individual who was a minor at the time in New York did in fact father York's, I'm sorry, did, did in fact deliver York's children. And there were a number of minors who um, were impregnated with you by York. And there was even three sisters who were pregnant at the same time with York. His, um, kids. So during this period, I forget which exact amount, but he had in one year, he had 13 kids in one year. His first two children were born in 1964, two girls by two different females. And he had his firstborn son a year later when he was 19. All right. So uh, some of the gory details was, um, you know, uh, it's one okay. guy broke it, down because he was broke down because uh, he actually after having sex with York, um, you know, he had to go use the bathroom and he was bleeding from the rectum. You know, um, that, that's a good point, because I, I want us to understand that there were no boundaries um, with Malachi York. And he had sex with anyone and everyone and no one was um, off limits. Now, I now when you when you introduce this type of doctrine to black men, um, well, I was about to say born in America, but I guess that's not true because New York is full of people that are from, you know, other places. So I won't, I won't say that. But when you're introducing this kind of doctrine, I'm getting ready to play his um, Amin Ra uh, teaching because Africa Bambada took on this title of the Amin Ra of hip hop culture. Mm -hmm. The Amin Ra, once you're affiliated with Malachi York, is not something to take lightly. And, and in light of the allegations against Africa Bambata with these, with these young men, uh, or and, and they're men now, but they were um, young then, teenagers and, and lower. Um, and even people 
even people that were of age, which which of age in New York was um, 17 years old. So, but just because that's the legal age doesn't mean, now that would mean he didn't quote unquote commit a crime, but it still does it. He still, it was, there was still, could be some kind of um, manipulation going on there. Go ahead, Chuck. Just for, just for clarity for the people watching is that, yeah, even with the whole statutory rape thing, you, it, it there was a rule that that person had to be within a, a four year age difference. You couldn't be in your forties and having sex with a seventeen year old, and that's what broke. That's part of what came out at the trial, where the the question was asked: How old were when you? How old were you when you first started having sexual? Uh, encounters with York and how it began. It started off with fondling, uh, oral, and eventually, you know. Um, and, and and let me just interrupt one second to the audience. Um, I think a lot of us are familiar with Dr. York, but you'll have to, um, Chuck has a lot on his website that we'll put down and there's been a lot on it. It's just, it's so disturbing that we just can't go into it in this um, recording, but go right ahead. Chuck. Yeah, and it's, I, I try, I, I want to, keep myself from the opinion portion of it because on the website what I try to do is give you trial notes or parts from the transcripts themselves from the trial seal or whatever otherwise that's why I put up there so you can be in this in the courtroom and listen for yourself to what these these uh, uh by that time were young adults on what what took place and what they experienced as well as um later on one of York's um um uh, wives or main wife on on what she said took place and what she participated in as as a co-defendant now I, this is what i wanted to mention earlier real fast you got to have the context and the context is that york was a sexual addict that once you have once that's fully established that kind of explains a lot as an now, addict was he diagnosed with that or or we're just saying his se sexual appetite knew no bounds I don't see, I haven't seen any documentation saying that this person was uh, diagnosed as being a sexual addict, if there is even such a thing. But based on the fact that he had over 100 plus children, and then- Well, well that, that, a lot of that is power though. So, so a lot of these uh, cult leaders, predators, um, and other, other names, th these things become demonstrations of power. power. And and a lot of a lot of that power and control. So it's not a natural sexual urge kind mm -hmm. of thing. It's a domination kind of thing, and that's why he would dominate even over the males and and ritualistically. Over. Yes. Now let's get <laughs> the audio because right. this is what I want to say um, in this Bambada Zulu Nation situation mm -hmm. um, is that meeting. If you're if you're already engaged in this in this um, praying on, over minors, I have the audio, Chuck. I have right. the audio. Oh, yeah, okay. Good okay, I thought you were looking for it. No. But if you're already engaged in this behavior, meeting Malachi York and his teachings, it's like, oh my God, here's the justification for my behavior. Yeah. So. Now, when Bambada met Dr. York, it would have been in the late 1980s. It wasn't before then. Now, remember, we have already heard from two alleged victims who say that their abuse with Africa Bam or by Africa Bambada was in the late 70s and early 80s. I have another one, number five. You haven't heard from him yet, but his was in 1983. Like, mm. I, I feel myself just getting furious. But um, so so now when he meets York, it's in the late 1980s or even let's say mid to late 1980s. Right. And now here comes this teaching to justify these crimes against, uh, in this case, male minors. So let's listen to this audio and then Chuck can, he can um, explain this Amin Ra um, to us. Uh oh, I had the wrong thing muted. Okay. What took place in the Amun Temple is that Min was depicted as a large statue, right? Only his penis.
his king is with his right hand and a quill in his left hand. And in there, he stood as a statue. Now, before he became a statue, it was a real event. And he would stand with his hand to his side, right? And his wife would come in and she would have to erect him, have him have an erection. He would spread his legs, penis is erected, he's laying this way. His wife would leave the temple with the high priestess women after he's erected. And they had these, these uh, priests, they would straddle his penis. If you follow what I'm saying, this was part of their one of their rituals. This doesn't mean every ritual that took place in Egypt is a part of our ritual. You follow what I'm saying? They were stuck, they had a whole bunch of priests that went into the spirit, that went into the sacred chamber, right? And this is how they vowed loyalty to the great God, Amun. You know what I'm saying? They didn't look at it the way we now see it as homosexual, or they didn't see it that way. They looked at it as a covenant that he became a, that he, that when he ejaculated or whatever, he, they became a part of him and they left there as gods. And all went off in a sacred uh, resource performing the same ritual. This is why in the Catholic churches, those ministers never really, or pastors or fathers, or never really get prosecuted for having sex with the young boys. Because they're reenacting the ritual and the hat. Hmm. Go right ahead, Chuck. Well, uh, <laughs> that is pretty. I, I, he, he said, uh, I would like us, um, Chuck, if we could, and this is our last point, okay. um, Amun. Amun and like I, I was trying to explain, um, like in, in those languages, the vowels are usually interchangeable. So right. you have Amun, Amen, Amin, just like my name, Laila, and then the L-E, the L-A-Y, the L-A-I, those mm -hmm. are interchangeable. So can you please, we heard him just now describe a ritual of the priests coming in to straddle the great god Amun, right. but can you tell us who Amun is? And then Bambada took on the name Amen, Amen Ra. Well, as far as what he's saying, there's well, no, uh, I haven't seen any documentation to support that ritual. I, I deal with people who study the language and the, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, right. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's kind of threw me off because it's okay, like, I'm gonna whoa. stop, but no, 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 I no, no. Hey, it's, it's all part of it. my documentary, and I have an artist and everything. Like, I had a lot of b roll yeah. and everything to explain this yeah. properly. Got you. So, to the audience, we I apologize, gotcha. we're, we're doing the best we can, yeah. uh, verbally here. Go right ahead, Chuck. yeah. So, um, see, <clears throat> he. When he when when he was moving into this Egyptian type of uh, doctrine, that was when he was uh, pushing the whole Atunre Atunre Amunre, and then he took on the name himself uh, Atunre. Okay, now we have um, Atun Atunre, which is a new beginning. This is what he's teaching in um, uh, the Black Book. One of his uh, sacred scriptures, the um, the um, one of the new beginnings, and then you had the highest, which was uh, Atunre, and then the hidden one is Amunre, and and being secretive or hidden in some symbolic way, according to York in his psychosis, is um, how this Amun was able to do certain things because the ritual that he's supposed to be talking about in the temple of Amun is where these things took place. And it was it was brought up because York was claiming that uh, Unkin Aten was a hermaphrodite and he was a homosexual. And he was intimidated by the obelisk that was around in the different temples at the time. So he wanted to move that. He wanted to remove it because of his intimidation. <laughs> Nothing documented in this whatsoever. And that's when he starts to go into the story of what took place in the temple of Amun. And these men who, as a part of the covenant and to show that loyalty, they gave of themselves and they straddled them. 
Okay. Now, yeah. the reason I I found that in the article to be um of 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 importance is because in one of the in one of the uh, testimonies, um, a young individual um, pointed out to the prosecution when he was being uh, questioned that, let me see if I can pull it up. Um, he said, um, okay, uh, okay, so tell the jury what happened during that incident with you, Mr. York, um, X person, that person. Uh, LaRoche says that um, he tried to perform anal sex on me again over there, but that's when he told me that it was about the Egyptians God, the Egyptian gods who used to have sex with each other with boys. Now this, at, at this time he was, um, he wasn't in that, he wouldn't know about this kind of stuff, you know, and this, and the other children made, the other um, kids, young kids at the time who testified about this made similar statements. You know, we thought he was an extra, we thought he was from another planet. So as part of that ritual, he was saying that that was what kept the people loyal to him. And then also, remember on that audio, if you go further on to it, he says that they would leave after they had this sexual escapade, they would leave and then they would go and set up their own groups performing the same ritual. This is what I want to say to survivors, especially Malachi York and um, Zulu Nation um, survivors, um, especially being male, um, female also, but this is what I want to say to you, is that these predators, especially the age where you were, where you say you were, you know, in the Quran, any of us who have any kind of background at all, I mean, we know the Bible, we know the Quran, we, whatever belief system you, you had or have or whatever, in, in any scripture, it'll, it'll talk about the shaitan or Satan coming right into the straight path. And like, I'll come at them while they're going to and fro, up and down, like he, wherever, wherever you are, um, that, that was going to come into the straight path. Now that's that this is what I want to say. Wherever children are, there are predators. I don't care if it's the, uh, the YMCA. I, I better not start naming people, naming organizations, but wherever wherever children are gathered, you're gonna there uh, you know, these pedophiles are are attracted to them. And this is and and for you, don't beat yourself up because these predators came right into your prepubescent or teenage development. Like you're, you're just getting these hormones. You just discovered this part of yourself. Like, hey, what's that down there? Like, I know guys go through this whole discovery when they discover mm -hmm. their own, um, you know, right. private area. And, and that person came right into your natural development like right into your straight path mm -hmm. and they 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 just distorted it and they preyed on you and and it was not your fault at all period um you know i just wanted i just really want to say oh, that yeah. I, I just want people to see how cunning these cult leaders are and it's always usually in my research there's some kind of sexual we may look at it as sexual gratification but it's an all out assertion of power over anything and everything yeah. around me. It is dominating mm -hmm. anything and everyone around me. Yeah. Now, um, one second, because I'm gonna open up the Zoom in, in case anyone wants to come in. And if not, we'll let Chuck have the, um, you know, say the final words from him, because see, I started getting really like just curious. Yeah. And, uh, and, and uh, the but, audio uh, that that if anybody wanted to find that audio, yeah, yeah, it was called um, "Wealth, Sex, and Death: The Three Principles." Okay. Now the other thing is that in the coming days and weeks, see, I'm still really, really upset right now. Understood. In the coming days and weeks, we we will continue the investigation into the Zulu Nation. Mm -hmm. We will hear from members 
of the Zulu Nation, Bambada affiliates, and we're going to see that he absolutely made York's teachings part of the Zulu Nation's teachings. And this was supposed to be a hip hop awareness group. Um, they're into social service and uh, all kinds of community benefit. And then they actually started adopting these religious beliefs from York. And when York was arrested, Bambada was about to, um, you know, they were had this whole benefit plan to benefit his legal his legal mm -hmm. funds. Yeah. So, whew, okay, I'm gonna bring it down. I'm gonna open it up. Chuck, go right ahead. And thank you um, for the super check chat. I was able to see um, Pookie X and <laughs> Sun Tzu. And so if I missed anyone, thank you. And um, go right ahead, um, Chuck. So far, no one has joined us. And if they don't okay. join us, that's no, fine. I, I, we will say our, our good night. I thought it was, it, it was very, I think it is worth mentioning again on that audio where he said, the rituals are still going on in high mass. This is why the Catholic churches, those ministers never really, ministers, pastors, or fathers, or whatever they call them, never really get prosecuted for having sex with young boys because they're enact, reenacting the ritual and the hat. It's right there in front of everybody. The fish head, if you look at a fish, most women- oh, Hold on, are you, are you explaining what the hat is? Go right ahead. I'm explaining it because that's what he was saying. If you can, if you continue on with the audio, he's talking about that, that the Pope's hat and all of these things were symbolic of a fish, which was symbolic of a penis. So that was his little way, I guess, of, of justifying it. Because then we find that children who were molested by him, sexually abused by him, made the point to indicate that, yeah, he mentioned something about it, it was a part of an Egyptian thing. It's not gay. Don't worry about it. It's not gay. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's really, <clears throat> Zulu King Malik, I see you. We're, we're going to let you in in just a second. It's really um, <clears throat> disturbing and infuriating. And um, for anyone who thinks that they could not become prey to a cult or your young people or relatives cannot become prey to a cult, understand how fragile the human mind is. And that's why a lot of these lies and curated history that the Zulu nation has perpetrated onto the world of hip hop, where we have to set the record straight because when you don't, when your brain doesn't operate, it's almost the same as if when you eat vegetables as opposed to processed foods. And if your mm -hmm. brain does not operate on, on actual facts, you, you're gonna make errors and mistakes. And if you are operating off of beliefs and believing in someone and their teachings, um, we are all bound to be flawed individuals. But I'm not gonna preach, excuse no, me, no, I'm no. gonna take That's myself and make myself a little but more. That was, the, um, that, was the, that was the faith that we had in him. We yeah. live by faith. Yes. You know, all this talk about we don't believe, or I don't believe in anything. You know, that was a that was a talking point that York put out in yeah. his books. That we don't believe in anything. We got to have the facts. And then he later on, when he started pretending to be a Christian, he started saying that, well, in order for you to believe the Holy, in order for you to accept the Holy Tabs, you had to believe it. So anytime you have to accept anything, you believe it. This is what York said, right? Yeah. So that last part in that thing, it was that, that it says, they don't look at it. He said, they didn't look at it as homosexuality or they didn't see it the way you do it was it was a covenant and when he ejaculated or whatever they became part of him left there as gods and went into a sacred priesthood performing the same ritual that's what he said on the audio yeah yeah so we are joined by uh zulu king malik and his um his uh it's connecting to the audio and then when he's connected We'll go right ahead. The Zoom link is pinned. And if there are no more Zooms, we will, um, after we speak to uh, Malik, we will call it a night. Go right ahead. Peace. 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 This is Brother Malik. Yes, sir. Pickle man. Yeah, I was <laughs> one. I was, hey, Chuck, what's going on? All right. There's, there's no way that I could turn down the opportunity not to jump on if Chuck was on here. Cool. Um, I just want to say like this. Uh, I hope people are really listening 
And yet, um, there's many people I've blocked in the room. Mm. Um, and it's disturbing that people give this man credence uh, with, with all the information that's been released on him, yet people just can't let it go. Cognitive and um, cognitive dissonance. Yeah, cognitive dissonance. And so I just want to basically thank Chuck. Um, you know, over the years I've gotten to know Chuck and basically just say to those that are taking issue with what's saying with what's being said about Dr. Pork. Um, you have newopinism.com mm -hmm. and you have Chuck Morgan's YouTube channel, Chuck Morgan. When you look at newopinism.com, Chuck intentionally sets up question formats the same way that York would ask questions. Mm -hmm. And he's giving you verbatim answers from his books, meaning York's books, audios and videos. So don't be mad at Chuck because Chuck is just, all Chuck is doing is repeating what York stated and Man, asking questions. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, well, yeah. well, you know, um, when you're a member of um, not just this organization, but a lot of, a lot of organizations, just period, they mm -hmm. feel very strongly. Um, they are very committed. Um, even when I started doing this project uh, and all the pushback I got from uh, Zulu Nation, people in the Zulu Nation. So people do feel that way and it's just nothing we could do about it. And um, as we as we continue our investigation, you know, they'll be there. I mean, I had to block a, a lot of people from uh, Rick Ross's video the mm -hmm. other day, but, um, but uh, Malik, Malik, brother Malik has an interview coming up and you're gonna see um, how Bambada actually did incorporate the teachings of Dr. York into this hip hop awareness crew. Now that implication is for the alleged victims. It is for all of us who grew up on hip hop and it is for the, for the history of hip hop where there have been numerous documentaries, books and all kinds of things and, and repeating a false what I am calling a false history of the uh, universal Zulu nation that we will continue to dissect in the um, coming weeks. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Brother Malik. There's um, Jonathan has entered the waiting room. I'll let um, Jonathan in. Go right ahead. Um, um, the, last thing, the, the last thing I wanted to say is this. I am a former member of the universal Zulu nation from the age of 14 to 37. OK. And when I saw the name of the documentary being changed from. Hang on, honey. Hang culture, on, honey. Uh, Hang on, hon. um, if you're not going to show your face, um, you know, I'm I'm going to I'm going to try it. But I'm telling you right now, like it, it's not happening. So if you're not going to show your face and if you come in here disrespecting at all, you're out of here. Go ahead, Malik. So I've seen, you know, we all saw it was formerly called Trapped in the Culture to what it's called now. I just want to say this to those that are getting offended by the title. Um, if you know that you're not homosexual, then you know that it's not pertaining to you. Right? And it's the title is pertaining to those individuals that were engaging in that activity with him. That's it. It's not talking about the rest of us who were not and who did not know and who were oblivious. It's not talking about that. So I just wish people would really not be so upset by what it's stating. Because again, if you review the documentary, what was it that certain individuals said? Am, am I wrong? Yeah, you know, was, actually, was, was, was that not stated? You know, so what are we getting upset about? Yeah, we, we've made a lot of headway 
we, as far as the membership goes and the um, title. So I think we, I think we've moved on from there. So yeah. I'm going to see this other person that's in here and then we will yes. call tonight. I don't want to um, go real long. And, and if he's not, thank you, um, Malik. Thank you so much okay. for, for helping. Um, I'm a long live pickle man. <laughs> so I'm going to try this last person and um, a law region number one. I don't know what this thumbnail is. This is what's irritating me. It has like a whole bunch of um, um, advertisements. That's why I put you back in the waiting room. So can you start your video? I don't know what this is. We'll give you a couple minutes to start your video without that thumbnail. I don't, I don't know what that is. Um, so Chuck. Yes. Okay, I, I'm looking at my notes and I actually think we got through everything. I'm gonna try this person one last time and then we will call it a night and thank you for all of your help. And, and Anytime. Your, okay, so Anytime. This, I'll put the video, so. Okay, um, so um, thank you again. And we'll see you next time. We're gonna go deeper, but before we can, I, I wanted, um, before we have more uh, alleged victim testimony or interview footage on the upcoming episodes, I wanted people to have this teaching in mind and that Africa Bambata took that name, Amin Ra of hip hop culture. And then we discover what this teaching was with Dr. York. And I mean, he could say, I didn't take that name from that teaching. I mean, mm -hmm. say that, but I just want us to know, to have the knowledge on what that teaching was and, and um, the abuse, the alleged abuse of young men and boys and how that teaching, York's teaching became a part of the um, Zulu nation. I think that that's something that needs to be thoroughly looked into because um, I mean, you have like different groups to go by that name, but in York's mind, he had already developed a, a narrative of what it was and how to use it on other people as part of one of his inner circle ritualistic orders. So he already had an idea. Now, York has a bad habit of hijacking stories and then developing his own, which is pretty much what he did here. Because what he said, uh, Unc Atten was a hermaphrodite and he was a homosexual. And he was, he was, he didn't like the idea because he was intimidated at the sight of obelisks, which caused him to, to try to remove them and this is, and he goes into this, um, this, 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 this detail about homosexual rituals in the temple of Amun. Go ahead. Okay, hang on, Jonathan. Thank you for joining us. I just want to say one thing before we go to him, is that I feel bad that people are getting to know me under these circumstances. <laughs> I'm investigating the Zulu Nation mm. plus Malachi York. All these, uh, I mean, cases and. Uh, abuse story, stories of abuse and everything. And so I, 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 um, you know, I could black out like anybody else. And I just feel bad that, you know, people can sense my, um, <laughs> tone, but go right ahead, Jonathan. Thank you for joining us. If you have a question or comment. Yeah, I have a quick question. This is my first time tuning in. So, uh, great, great show. I like to say, um, how you doing, John? Hey, how you doing? How y'all doing? Uh, I just have a quick question. Um, do you think, uh, TC uh, Islam, you think that was actually a hit or? Um, I did a, in, I did a video that I would just ask everyone to watch where I go through what everything that I know, um, the, the case documents, uh, who was arrested for that and um, what was the Zulu nation involved or not involved. So I kind of did that already and I don't want to bring that over into this one. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. So you'll see it on my page. It says the final days of um, TC Islam. There's so much, um, so much uh, material and information that I kind of have to keep everything like this, um, just for organizational purposes when when people are looking for it. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. So gotcha. yeah, it's, definitely it's there it on the page and um, I'll look for your comment after you see it. <laughs> okay, well, one more quick question. Sure. Do you think um, like a lot of the artists, the hip hop artists that were affiliated, do you think they didn't know about the stuff that was going on in the dark? It, it was, was more so about the culture. Yeah, with like the like the KRS ones and the uh, um, <laughs> Tribe Called Quest and all of them that was somewhat affiliated. You think it was more so of them just following the the teachings and stuff, and they didn't really know about what was going on in the back. Well, right. um, because we're we're kind of early in. I want to finish presenting the information and I just want the public to kind of decide. Like I did try as hard as I could to interview people relevant to this story with not who have knowledge of it. And I would rather present the information and then we all kind of, um, you know, I watch the whole discussions going on, but I don't want to influence that conversation. <laughs> Sorry, is that I just I do have some opinions now. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but but I know everything that I've done. You know what I'm saying? But you guys don't. So I would rather um, present the information and we all discuss the contradictions or whatever the case may be. We're kind of early in. We're not even halfway done yet. But I know how okay. y'all are. It's like what? Why is it taking so long? You know, <laughs> usually this episode tonight would have only been 30 minutes, but because we have Chuck and then we're going live, this is usually, this is longer than normal. So, okay. all right. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us. And um, Chuck, any yeah. any final words? Thank you, Jonathan. Oh, no, no, I, I appreciate, um, you know, being able to assist in any way. That's what I do. I mean, it's not, see, people have the tendency to think that I'm just on this campaign. I, people have questions. They want to know, they want context, and I offer it for free. So that's what the part of the website and anyone who wants to hear, and if I can assist and and bring more insight and clarity, that's what I do. And I appreciate you and all that you've done. And I really love the idea that, you know, was able to, it's the first time when I, when I talked to you and how, you know, with Uncle and, you know, all that stuff, it was really cool. And I'm, 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 Happy to say that I can call you my friend. And um, anything you never need, just hit me up anytime. Well, we'll be having you come back towards the end, but we have to cover a little more ground. Mm-hmm. I will put the, it's kind of hard when you do the, the live Zoom, but all those links um, mm-hmm. and your cash app and all that stuff will be in the um, description. And thank you for joining us. And we'll we'll all say good night.